which will have to be given another new link. In, in the same, like in attendees link, they have to join in the attendees link. But uh, means they will have to be sent the new attendees link, right? No, already have this... sent to you. Is it required? Then I can send you in this right now. I am sending uh, you your WhatsApp. Yeah, give me the yes, sir. Please give me the attendee link on WhatsApp. I can then forward it to the students because the that link is not working. The older link. Sikhar sahab, I, uh, I sent that, that mail, I, I sent the uh, link. Okay, sir. Yes. And sir, please uh, please forward the panelist link to Walia sir. Uh, Walia sir said yesterday, last night, that uh, VC sir might be able to join the valedictory session. So he will need the panelist link. I have sent it in the last night itself. Okay, okay, then it's fine. Okay. And I had a talk to his peers in the morning. He received Achha. it. Okay, okay, perfect. perfect. I told the peers also, so you, you also join at the yeah. say, tomorrow uh, today morning, 11 o'clock onwards will be there, so you can test it. I asked okay. him also. Okay. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, uh, those who are uh, facing trouble in joining the session, they can join the session using the same link which we have used yesterday. Yes. Okay, the same link, same link is working. The same link, okay. It is the same link which we are using yesterday and today. It's the same. All right. I thought because this is a meeting was different, means I thought it, it is different. So I thought it would require a new link. Okay, never mind then. Okay. Same link, same link. Okay. All right. In turn, they should join through their registration. They should enroll it. Of but course. No matter. No yeah. actually, actually, I showed them, sir. Earlier, I showed them how it means NIDM programs they have attended before as well. So I uh, I told them to uh, log in and uh, register through that. But the registration link on the on the uh, list of programs on the NIDM website that was not working. That's why I sent them the direct link later on. That was not working. That uh, name is bit changed. That is the three day right. capacity building. What yeah, I yeah. Uh, and after corrected uh, correction also I have sent the poster also in the same poster they should join. Got it, sir. Got it. Okay. Yeah, okay. a couple of students are here, so they are able to join, so it's fine. Yeah. Good morning, Dr. Ail Haldar, sir. Morning. Uh, sir, am I, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are very much audible. Okay, sir, and please wait, sir. Just just, just tell me, am I visible also? Just the panel will say just one second. Or just one second. Yes, you are visible, very much visible. Okay, sir, thank you. But your head is truncating. Okay, sir. Please beat down the camera. Okay, now it is fine. Thank you, sir.
हजार सर शैल वी स्टार्ट द प्रोग्राम हलदार सर आर यू देर यस दीपाली हाउ मेनी कैंडिडेट्स आर ज्वाइन 21 20 okay. Nice okay, no it. Start it so that we should be in time. Please continue. Oh, let's wait for two more minutes, sir. Because we'll you have it. to complete it in time. Okay, okay. Maximum two, maximum one minute. Okay. Okay. Okay, sir. Sure. Thank you. ओके सो नाउ इट इज इलेवन फाइव सो लेट्स बिगिन आवर प्रोग्राम नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू द थर्ड डे ऑफ अवर थ्री डेज ऑनलाइन ट्रेनिंग प्रोग्राम ऑन कैपेसिटी एनहेंसमेंट ऑन डिजास्टर रिस्क रिडक्शन एंड रेजिलियंस इन द एजुकेशन सेक्टर इन कोलेब्रेशन विद दी नॉर्थ ईस्टर्न हिल यूनिवर्सिटी सो बिफोर यू बिगिन आवर सेशन आई वुड लाइक टू रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर अमृत लाल हदार टू काइंडली प्रेजेंट दी रिकैप्चुलेशन ऑफ द लास्ट टू डेज और एंड द लास्ट डे स्पेसिफिकली ओवर टू सर Okay, thank you. So, could you uh, hear me, Dipali? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, good morning, Professor Sikhar and attendees and our panelists. And it is a privilege to me to talk before you in this third day of the training program. So, <clears throat> this uh, on yesterday there are three training classes were there from the eminent speaker. First one was. and i will tell what was the about the brief of that within a minute so uh, so that we can maintain the time in properly because our very directly session will be there where uh, our vc new uh, north east hill council he may join so we should be in time so i will request also all the speaker to complete it within their uh, allotted time so i'll just take a minute or one and half minute only so yesterday the first speaker who was eminent scientist from nrsc hyderabad Uh, dr v bhanu murthy he was a associate director now retired from nrsc hyderabad and he talked about the space technology for flood management he has highlighted the different uh, phenomena of uh, with the help of space data for the uh, say flood incidents of brahmaputra which is generally normal monsoon what happened the how the uh, flood takes place how it can ma manage and along with other five different types of flood in and also he talked about the mitigation strategy in different ways as per rashtriya barwag 
what are the mitigations are there he has highlighted on that also. he has talked about the emergency management and types of emergencies plan regarding he has highlighted a lot the bhuvan a massive database is created by nrsc how it could be used and how, how much fruitful it is for that he has given now the next speaker mr arjun nai he is a young leading scientist from gsi lucknow he talked about the seismic micro zonation using geophysical techniques and some case studies he has shown where he various types of waves that is body waves and lava waves and surface waves he told and how they are generating from an earthquake and he has elaborated to give the concept of micro uh, zonation an idea has given for surface wave that it is having very low frequency low velocity but it is having high amplitude and which is destructing a lot during the uh, during the earthquake within the surface and he talked about the mam and its array acquisition parameter samples of acquisition sorts 1d and 2d masw he talked about it and also told the common phenomena that is electrical resistivity survey how it could be used to deciphering the different layers within the subsurface and after that he told what are the relation of liquefaction with the uh, with the saturated uh, i mean that alluvium rock and how the destruction is coming through the liquefaction he has told about that he talked about the bugar anomaly map of northeast india and a probable fault fault in the subsurface and he has given a role in subsurface magnetic map in that northeast area also third speaker that is our colleague ms dipali she who is a junior consultant in our this uh, nidm he explained nicely the role of post disaster reconnaissance data and documentation in enhancing landslide studies she talked about levels of landslide studies also highlighted the goals of post disaster reconnaissance survey and importance of documentation in case of disaster she said such studies that will help in documenting and damaging aspect of the events leads to different case histories oil documented case histories to end at the end she discussed a few case studies in say in 2018 kerala and lebanon landslide chamoli rock slide which was happened during this year february so thereafter yesterday session was over and today's session with a pool of energy our professor sikhar is here with us and will share his knowledge now i will hand over to dipali please dipali you can go for yes, uh, briefly recapitulating the session of oh, yesterday uh, now i would like to call upon the first speaker of our session uh, he is dr shikhar kumar from northeastern hindi university before he start the session i would like to introduce sir dr shikhar kumar is a guest lecturer in the department of geology northeastern hindi university since march 2021 he is com he completed his bsc geology in Panchungla University College, Mizoram University, MSc Geology in Mizoram University, and PhD in October 2020 from Mizoram University as well. His research is focused on hydrogeology, and his PhD thesis focused on the effects of the rapid urbanization on the potable water sources, both surface and subsurface of Varanasi city in Uttar Pradesh. With these words, now I call upon Dr. Shikhar to kindly take over the stage and address our audience. Over to you, sir. I have given the presenter rights also to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Pali. Uh, good morning to everyone. uh today i am here uh and i have given i have been given a chance to give this lecture uh thank you to an idm for that uh let me just share my screen and start without wasting too much time as we have a, a very strict schedule so give me one second i hope my screen is visible to everyone so we will see yes it is visible all right uh so once again good morning to everyone today 
uh, in today's in the third day and fin final day of the training program on capacity enhancement on disaster risk reduction and resilience in education sector i will be talking about water related disasters management and risk assessment so water related disasters i also means you can also say it, call it as climate change related disasters because, and i will tell you the reason why uh, in a second so water related disasters really if you think about it most of the disasters all the disasters, disasters which we are seeing and we have been seeing in various lectures uh, are somehow related to water uh, and uh, also somehow related to the either with presence of water or lack of water so we'll be seeing uh, uh, in the slides ahead what i mean by that so let me just uh, move on to the next slide so let me just uh, introduce with the basic terminology as i know that many of the participants here are uh, students so i just want them to know the basic terminology of what are the things which we are discussing so uh, give me one second uh, So hazard, uh, if you have heard the word hazard, means the elements of the physical environment harmful to man and are caused by forces extraneous to him. So a hazard has the potential to cause harm to people, human activity, property, and the environment. So disaster is basically manifestation of a hazard. Hazard is the danger which can happen, which is the thing which we are trying to avoid, basically. That is the main idea behind the entire disaster uh management uh, theme but we can't really avoid uh, all the disasters not everything can be stopped uh, by uh, human efforts so so that then we have to deal with the management and like uh, the we have to deal with the disaster which has already occurred and live through it so we have to learn to live with it in a way so hazard is the thing uh, which is going to happen this is the thing which is going to happen which we have we want to avoid and we want to live through it and when it manifests itself it's when it realizes itself it is called a disaster okay so a disaster is the realization of the hazard now hazard event is a physical parameter of the hazard which cause you harm to humans and society okay it's a hazard event then natural disasters are hazard events that causes very large number of fatalities and or or damage to property. Those are natural disasters. There are many natural disasters which we'll be talking about uh, some of them uh, in the lecture today. So let's move on. Uh, and uh, now there are different kinds of natural hazards. There are geological natural hazards, hydrological natural hazards, meteorological natural hazards, and biological natural hazards. Mm -hmm. uh, so which uh, the the examples of these are uh, on your screens. So I'm not going into too much detail. This is just the basic things which I wanted uh, all the students to know so that we can understand what we are talking about. Okay, so now, so climate change and natural disasters. Uh, I said in the first slide when I just started that water related water related disasters are very much like climate change disasters. Why do the, why do I say that? Are is there any relationship between uh, the climate change which we know it's a really serious problem uh, for human beings? Uh, as the situation is getting worse and worse and if there is a relationship what is that relationship what kind of disasters uh, are getting are increasing in number due to climate change and if those and what are those disasters and what can we do to avoid such thing being happening so let's see what are the relationships which we can see so these are the few graphs which i have uh, the source of which will be will be available in the next slide so as you can see from the year 1960 there is, there is a sudden increase in the uh, presence of disasters like drought, floods, extreme weather, extreme temperature conditions. All of these things are increasing, have, have increased in the past 50, 60 years. So, and if you see in this graph, this is the uh, average, global average surface, surface temperature graph uh, uh, for, for the whole planet. So as you can see, since the 1950s, 60s, the global average surface temperature has gone up significantly. The reasons for all of that we already know, greenhouse effect and the pollution uh, presence of a lot, large amount of carbon dioxide due to all the industries and all those things. We all know that, so I'm not going to uh, go into too much detail. But the increase in temp surface temperature is shown a very, so, you can see the relationship between this is the graph which is showing 
that the combination of all natural disasters uh, all on earth, the number of all natural disasters on earth, as you can see from the 1950s, 60s, there is a sudden increase in the number of natural disasters. And you can see the similar thing, uh, the increase in temperature of the uh, surface, average surface temperature from the same time. So there has to be a relationship between these two things. Okay, there is a relationship which we'll be discussing. Okay, so this is one way you can see the relationship how climate change is severely affecting uh, the natural system of our planet and thus increasing all the different kind of natural disasters which we have to deal with. And not only that, they are also increasing the uh, the intensity of those natural disasters uh, in in uh, as well. So they are more destructive. They are causing more damage. Uh, and so on. So let's move on. So what are water related disasters? So water related disasters, uh, I have uh, listed these the disasters which are which I consider as water related disasters. So you can see floods, of course, are water related disasters, but droughts are also water related disasters. How? So there is a lack of water in an area. So it is also uh, a water related disaster. It's, it's the similar uh, an analogy can I can tell you is like uh, darkness is basically absence of light so if there is no light there is dark darkness but they are related to each other so similarly uh, lack of water causes droughts so it is also considered as a water related disaster okay now forest fires forest fires will also be considered as a forest, uh, water related disaster as the climate change is getting worse and worse the weather patterns are becoming more and more uh, i should say concentrated what that means is the the summers are harsher, the rains are happening in a much smaller time frame, but heavier. So the rainfall, it means if I will show you the data later on, that the rainfall hasn't decreased a lot, but it is happening in a shorter and shorter time period in the year. What that means is there's a longer period of dry season. When there's longer period of dry season, also average temperatures are rising, or the you all know that that the summers are getting much and much harsher. So dryness is there, so there are more and more forest fires. We, we, uh, means uh, I've been in Mizoram for a long time, and even in Mizoram, uh, the temperatures never used to be so high like how it is now. Means uh, during my school times, the uh, the weather was nearly like Shillong. You never needed uh, fans or anything, but now it is. You definitely need it. Plus the the number of incidents of forest fires in Mizoram have also increased. During the dry season, this is the dry season for uh, Meghalaya and Mizoram and all these areas where the months of November, December, January, February are the time periods where there is there is no rain or very less rain. So at the uh, bit, like normally what used to happen is like at the end of February or beginning of March, something like that, there will be the rain will be starting uh, in Mizoram. But now it's not happening like that. The rain is getting delayed further and further. The rains. The real rain or heavy rain starts uh, at the end of March or even in April. That increases the dry period, increases the dry period, and so uh, there are more uh, uh, reasons to have forest fires. And forest fires are more conducive to happen. I will not go into detail about forest fires. Uh, Dr. Raj Shekhar uh, in the first day has uh, taken that topic, so I'll not go into too, too much detail. Now, wind storms, typhoon, hurricanes, these things are also increasing in number. Uh, the 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 change in climate condition have increased the number of uh, cyclones which are happening in our Bay of Bengal. Even though it's not like they were having less cyclones before, but they are even still the number is increasing and the cyclones are getting much stronger. They last for a longer time. They are higher category ones and they're causing more and more damage. Okay, so now. Uh, Waves and surges, tidal waves, tsunamis, this, these are also, also water related disasters. Uh, what, what these do, the, the, the extra damage these kind of things do are when these kind of, uh, when the seawater is uh, coming onto the land or the coastal areas uh, of our country or anywhere in the world, what happens, they also contaminate the, the surface water uh, which, are, which are maybe present there like lakes which can be like uh, they can get salinized because of the presence of seawater and they also uh, contaminate the groundwater in that area so they that's a really a secondary damage which these kind of things do okay now slides landslides and avalanche they are also considered as water related because 
means of course landslides are happening due to some uh, some conditions but most of the time especially in uh, in uh, northeastern area in hilly areas landslides the main reason for that is uh, rain so rainfall causes landslide not i'm not saying that without rain there won't be any landslide but the number and the probability of landslides of course increases uh, with rainfall so of course water is a major factor and okay, so landslides avalanche avalanche of uh, of uh, in snowy areas of course also is related to precipitation so water is a uh, important factor then epidemics are also caused by water related uh, what is also water related so there are waterborne waterborne diseases uh, which are basically there which become prevalent in certain conditions so the certain conditions is presence of moisture presence of uh, puddled waters can cause mosquitoes and malaria comes and so on so there are many diseases which are waterborne and they are also called by water related reasons okay so yeah so uh, although floods uh, uh, were discussed by Dr. Bharuguti uh, in the previous lecture, and today as well, uh, I think um, Professor Hada will uh, take a flooding uh, assessment in, a, in his topic as well. But I'll just discuss a few things, uh, basic things which you should know, so that you will be better, you will be able to understand the lecture from Professor Hada in a better way. So, what kind of floods are there? Okay, so river line flood. What is river line flooding? Due to heavy precipitation or gla glacial melt with resultant runoff. So suppose there's a lot of precipitation happened in the upstream side of a river or a, gla a lot of glacier, a glacier melts in a sudden, uh, in a very large amount. So there will be a lot of water running off towards the downstream side and thus creating floods. So that is right. It's called river line flooding. Now, flash flooding, of course, you guys have heard of it. It's the uh, occurs in hilly regions due to uh, very heavy precipitation sometimes. And it can solve flash flooding. I will be going quickly. Uh, we, I only have 15 minutes. So urban flooding, when urban flooding is something which is very common in India, even though the entire city is not underwater, but certain areas are underwater. So that is due to lack of uh, 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 way of the water to run off. Okay, so there's not enough uh, uh, sewage facilities or not even, not enough uh, drainage, sorry, not enough drainage to for the water to uh, remove itself. Also, that happens due to bad engineering due, uh, during construction. It is important to make sure that during construction, the land is level. Okay, so if you create a uh, uh, depressed area where you are having construction, so the water will fill up there. Okay, so you need to either create more drainage so that the water can be moved out, or you have to uh, make sure during construction that the land, land has put in level condition. So it so with the help of gravity, the water can go uh, downstream. Okay, so that is the main thing which happens. The urban flooding is the main problem. And the main solution for that is just good planning. Okay, now coastal flooding, I discussed this a little bit uh, in the earlier slide, due to number of reasons, cyclones and associated things. Sea water can sometimes enter the coastal area, contaminating the groundwater, contaminating the surface water sources, maybe lakes or something. And it's really, it can be really damaging. Okay, now glacial lake or glacial lake outburst flood, the example of which very recently we saw in Uttarakhand, uh, the other uh, speakers have also discussed this uh, in February, the, the incident which happened at Uttarakhand. Uh, the glaciers have melted water sometimes between them, okay, means in the middle of the glacier. So the part of a glacier, uh, the, the bordering part, which is mixed with ice and land and all these things is basically acting as a dam to hold that water. But due to climate change, climate change is another factor here that uh, the water is melting faster. And so the, the thinning ice at the end, which is holding everything together, it just can't hold the large amount of water. It breaks apart. Suddenly all the water and the material and the uh, land, which is also there, the mud, everything, uh, goes downhill and creates uh, destruction. So we have seen the example of that uh, very, very destructive uh, um, flooding uh, mechanism. Then cloud burst, you guys know cloud burst, sudden uh, outburst of a lot of rain creating flooding in the low lying areas, facing damage. Okay, so moving on. There are some pics, photographs of floods. 
uh, here in the second foot of river, you can see the embankment has been basically broken through and the water is flowing in the area where it was not supposed to go. Here, the two bottom two examples you are seeing urban flooding, that is the maze, the most common kind of flooding, which I'm sure everyone has uh, at some point of time uh, witnessed uh, and have experienced. Just a small puddle, just a small area where there's a lot of water and you can't go through because the drainage is not good enough for the water to be cleared up. Okay. So on this side, there will be no flood. On that side, there will be no flood. Just in the middle, there is flood. So that is the most common and the most annoying kind of flooding. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So cause of floods can be various things. I'm not going to go discuss too many things here. Extreme rainfall, construction of dams, reverse behavior, and embankment, congestion in the drainage channels due to roads, railways, canals, haphazard growth of industrial and urban establishment, which is a very important factor uh, according to me. Then uh, lack of forest or uh, deforestation, basically. Embankments, uh, local water system, landslides, soil erosion, destruction, many things. So I'll just quickly go ahead. Now, so flood risk assessment. Uh, Dr. Hazar will discuss this later on. I'll just say uh, very briefly, probability of the occurrence of inundation taking into consideration the intervening mechanism like levees, flood walls, etc. So that is one way of uh, like assessing the flood risk which can happen. Then the second is impact and consequences that reflects the vulnerability or the potential to experience harm huh? and the exposure, quantifying the number of structures, people, area that could be exposed to the flood event. So uh, the two ways. So, in continuation, this is how we can manage the uh, flood risk. So, basically, either you can avoid the flood by creating a situation so that the drain, the water can be drained away in a fast way. So, that's the uh, the basic uh, argument is the basic uh, objective is keep people away from water. Okay, it was uh, given by Ratiya Varela 2016. To keep people away from water, first thing you can do is make uh, uh, the city in a way or whatever you're building the livable area so that water doesn't stay there there is enough uh, uh, drainage and the water goes away okay and so decrease consequences of flood event by decreasing exposure of property and people the, so that is risk prevention now there is also defense mechanism you can use structural or blend of structural and non-structural measure, measures such as dikes embankments or increasing capacity of existing water channels increasing upstream water retention okay now flood risk mitigation decrease the magnitude of severity of impacts through measures in the vulnerable areas that includes flood zonation regulations for flood proof buildings etc Flood preparation and response. Now we are entering the area where the floods have already occurred. You cannot uh, prevent all the kind of all kinds of flooding. There are ways. There are uh, uh, occasions when the uh, nature is very very harsh to us, and the situations with all the uh, preparations which we have done is just not adequate enough. So we'll have. We need to have a backup plan when the to have a response in case there is damage so development of early warning systems flood disaster management response plans reconstruction and activities compensation of losses through public private insurance and so on. so this is the entire flood risk management you can see the entire thing in this uh, diagram prevention mitigation is the first step of course then preparedness then response and then recovery okay this is the entire thing. and this can be used in any disaster not necessarily flooding uh, now, why the reason why I have focused on floods so much, even though I am talking about water-related disaster as a whole, floods are a very significant uh, disaster as far as India is concerned. Okay, it's a recurrent phenomenon in India that normally starts with the onset of monsoon, as we all know. United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction report of 2015 observed that out of the average annual loss of 9.8 billion dollars. In India, $7.4 billion is just damage caused by the floods. Okay, so it is an really significant thing which is causing annual damage and a lot of uh, loss of uh, not just financial things, but life as well uh, in India. Okay, so out of 37 states and the Union territories, it is estimated that 25 are flood prone in our country. The four major river basins which are flood prone are the Brahmaputra and Bara Basin. The Ganga Basin, these are both incredibly large basins and a large amount of population of India lives in those basins, as we all know. Then Northwest River Basin, Central India and Deccan River Basins. Okay, so uh, all these things uh, just shortly I just explained. And uh, uh, 
So move on to droughts now. So droughts are risen in frequency and ferocity during the past 50 years in India. The, the reason for this is a, a part of the reason is definitely climate change also. But there is another reason which we'll be discussing uh, ahead. Okay. On an average, 1,000 kilometers square of land about the size of the entire Mumbai city is declared drought prone every year. And around 6,000 million tons of topsoil containing rich plant nutrients vital for the fertility and moisture content of the land is washed away annually. Droughts are usually categorized under these three heads. Meteorological, which is uh, triggered by insufficient rainfall, which happens mostly due to weather changes and all those things. Now, agriculture caused by lack of adequate soil moisture to sustain crops and hydrological, a result of severe depletion in water table. This is the part which we'll be discussing in a little bit detail further ahead in the next. <laughs> so I'll not discuss this much. I actually I don't have much time, so I'll go a little bit faster. Cyclones, very shortly. Cyclones are increasing in number, and the the top 36 worst cyclones of the planet, in which the most uh, life was lost, 26 happened in our Bay of Bengal. Okay, 26. The 26 worst cyclones ever recorded in history out of the top 36 happened in Bay of Bengal. Now, another factor here is, of course, the Indian subcontinent, the population is higher. So deaths happen a little bit more uh, when compared to the other parts of the planet. But still, there is a lot of cy cyclone activity. We all know every year, Odisha and West Bengal and these coastal regions are always hit getting hit by cyclones. This is a really important uh, disaster. So as you can see, the number of hurricanes which, or cyclones which happened in the North Indian uh, Ocean starting from 1972 to now. Now there is not a sudden increase, but as you can see, there is the increase in number of uh, cy uh, cyclones which are happening. Earlier there were, some, there were some years when there were no cyclones at all, but now every year there are significant number of cyclones, at least two. Okay, moving. So now the slow disasters which are being waiting to happen. This is the part which I'll be a little bit focusing on groundwater depletion and subsequent contamination. You see here in this, uh, this is the groundwater depletion uh, uh, figure here showing the groundwater changes, the water table changes. This is the area where a lot of agriculture is happening. And so groundwater is very, in the really swift way it is going down, I'll go a little bit faster. <clears throat> uh, again, you can see in these maps, Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, these are the places where the groundwater, the water table has gone down significantly due to a lot of groundwater uh, uh, usage. Okay, uh, this map is showing the uh, the basin by basin map of how much groundwater is being used in various basins. Okay, now uh, the the pollution, the Delhi pollution thing, which is happening recently, I just I will just discuss a little bit. The main reason for the Delhi pollution is actually groundwater depletion. Uh, and I will explain it in a little bit. The groundwater depletion, which is happening in Punjab and Haryana and all those places, due to that, there was a law which was passed in 2009 that the, uh, that the uh, farmers cannot uh, irrigate their, uh, their uh, land before monsoon starts. So they, they delayed the irrigation time for the farmers to uh, start of monsoon. So it, uh, July, August, like that. Due to that, the, the, the eventual taking off of crop was delayed as well. So the crops are reaped around September, October. Now, since they are reaped at September, October, they don't have enough time to quickly clean up for the next round of crops. Okay, so the, so the best, easiest way to, uh, to remove, to clean everything is to burn them. So that's why they are forced to burn the, the rubble left after the uh, crops are done so that's why there is an increase now not not saying that delhi uh, delhi is a very clean air means or th throughout the year the air quality is really in unhealthy but during october november there is a sudden increase due to the uh, uh, burning of the crop rubbles and then during that time there is a cold river coming from the mountains towards the uh, gangetic rain and himalaya is basically acting as a barrier and so it brings all the smoke here. Now, because it is cold air, of course, it will stay down and the warmer air is uh, uh, 
covering it up. So the smoke basically stays on top of Delhi. So very shortly, it's just explain the situation. Okay, now moving on. So uh, this is uh, the research which I did in Varanasi city. As you can see from 2009 to 2015, the water table has gone down significantly. So this is just basically uh, IDW interpolation using JS environment. Uh, I use the uh, data from some of the bore well uh, uh, levels, water table data from the CGWB and my own data and created this map. So as you can see, the water table is gone down significantly in an area where there is so much groundwater and it is amply available and it is very easy to recharge. Even in those areas, water table is going down very fast. Why, what's the reason? The reason is increased and rapid urbanization. 1990 to 2018, as you can see how fast the uh, uh, city Varanasi has incre uh, increased in urbanization. The red part is the built up part, as you can see how much the city has grown. Again, uh, in this graph, the same thing is being shown, uh, how the urban area of the uh, city has increased throughout the year. Uh, and this again, saying the uh, showing the same thing, I'll go a little bit faster. Uh, what I did in my research is I created concentric areas circles uh, from the point of the central part of the city throughout the Varanasi district and then did uh, specific analysis of land use on that on those concentric areas to see how much uh, growth or change in land use is there in those areas now not just that even uh, i created four different uh, ways of uh, doing this analysis is called entropy approach uh, so using the uh, the built up area around rivers, the uh, Asi and Varuna rivers, then uh, built up area around the major roads and the highways and the built up area around the major hospitals and so on. What to do? So why research? Why do all this study uh, to why to do all this work? OK, what's the reason behind it? So this is my main objective with this lecture. The, all the students who are listening, my main objective is to make you interested in this field so that you can do some research and help the policy makers of this country make the correct decisions. Okay, uh, the research, the main reason for research is to help the decision makers make the decision. So if you're interested, means if I hope that uh, with my lecture, you were uh, getting interested in the field of research and you can help the uh, formation of new technologies for all the challenges which we have, uh, the climate change challenge and all the other challenges which we have discussed uh, in a very brief way. So I hope uh, you guys have, uh, means I, I have given you a little bit of an inspiration in this field. And so we need the youth of this country to uh, come into research. This is the best time. Actually, you guys are in the best possible uh, uh, generation. Means the uh, the presence of resources the which you guys have, the uh, uh, unlimited uh, access to the internet and all the books and the journals and the resources which you have that was never there before it means uh, i'm sure uh, dr halder and all the senior professors who are here they can tell us that they had to do even more effort they had to put even more effort when doing research as they have to do much more of, uh, work to uh, do the same kind of results so you guys are in having a lot more resources and very good technology to uh, help the nation and the world for the uh, future uh, problems which we are facing. And uh, with that, I end my lecture. Thank you uh, for your attention. I again thank uh, National Institute of Disaster Management, uh, Dr. A. L. Helda and uh, uh, Professor Surya Prakash and all the entire team uh, to uh, allow me to uh, give this lecture. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for giving such a nice uh, presentation and the session was very much informative also. And uh, rightly said by sir, when the disaster strikes, it usually manifests itself through water. And the role of youth is very important because uh, youth can help, the, uh, help to share the message of the disaster preparedness and they can also act as a change makers. So it's very important the, the education of the disaster management and preparedness for the youth specifically, the students especially. So with these words, uh, I would like to thank you once again, sir, for joining us and sharing your thoughts with the audience. Sir, uh, as I'm able to see, uh, this, there are no questions right now, but in case if any question arises, I will forward to you. Yes, of course. Yeah. So thank you so much, sir, for joining. Thank you.
So moving ahead towards our next technical session, now we have with us the convener of the program only, Dr. Amritlal Haldar. So before we begin the presentation of Dr. Haldar, I would like to introduce Dr. Haldar to you. Dr. Haldar is Dr. Haldar has obtained the post graduation degree in exploration geophysics from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. Yeah, he received his PhD degree from Vikram University with Jain MP. And uh, after that, he pursued, uh, I think, which he had pursued during the job. After passing out of IIT Kharagpur, um, he served as the Danish International Development in the project government of Odisha, Bhubaneswar, as a geophysicist from 1985 to 1988. Thereafter, he joined the Remote Sensing Application Center, UP Lucknow, as the scientist CSC, and elevated up to a up to scientist SG. He has worked on the geophysical exploration for groundwater on the hard rock area of Bundelkhand as well as the alluvial area of the entire UP. Remote sensing GIS and DGPS, LIDAR and bathymetry. Lots of work uh, has been done on cadastral resources mapping for the state of Uttar Pradesh and he has completed more than 38 projects sponsored by internationally, nationally, state of UP and other states. He was appointed as the Director of Remote Sensing Application Center, UP, for a duration of the two years and got superannuated in March 2020. Presently, he is working as a consultant of the Flood Monitoring Cell at National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Delhi. To the credit, he had a 67 technical paper in International National Journal and the Symposium. And he has also visited many foreign countries uh, for the technical program organization like France, Italy, and Switzerland. So, with this introduction, now I request Dr. Haldar to kindly take over the stage and please address our audience. Over to you. Thank you, Dipali. So, please put the presentation for me. Yes, sir. Is it visible? Dipali? Yes, sir. Uh, it's visible. Now, uh, kindly please put the slide show. I hope it is uh, now it is you can, you can see that it's in a slide show. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. please go ahead. Good morning again to all those dignitaries as well as the participants. So, <clears throat> especially I'll talk in this session that are the digital cadastral maps for flood assessment. Of course, uh, Dr. Sikhar and yesterday Dr. Bhanumurthy, he told a lot of things, but I'll say some specific things for the cadastral, uh, how the digital maps could be used for flood assessment. So, you know what is the cadastral? What is the cadastral? That is, especially there are two things. One is parcel boundary and another is the uh, parcel number. These are the important things and it's a very important documents all over India. And you see in the bottom, that is the cadastral map is there, that is very faint in nature. Of course, of course, in uh, all over India, there are two, three scales are there, starting from one is to 4,000. If uh, instead of 4,000, it is one is to 3,960 and somewhere it is one is to 5,000, one is, one is to 8,000 scale. These are the very, I mean, uh, very specific map and where the uh, accuracy involved is very very high because you know that when we are talking for one is to four thousand that is in the map one millimeter is equal to the four meter on ground now you see while preparing the soft copy how much uh, precautionary measure we have to take so this is the things you can understand because one one uh, that is in the microtip pane if you scratch, that is one millimeter, if, or uh, very nearby, and that is equal to the four meter in ground. So, if some accuracy or some elongation or some deformation is there, then very very serious thing will be happening in the ground, and no landowner is will be ready to digest that one foot of land for that it will go for the other's land. So, now you talk the the you know the history that quite long it is there, but it, in terrestrial survey, it has been started in India during 1904. And at that time, Survey of India has taken the uh, stock. Stock means they have taken the command 
to prepare. And basically, and uh, before that, in Romanian country, other country it was there. But I'll go a little faster because time in view of that, uh, keeping in view the shortage of time. Because after me, that another 20 minutes lecture will be given by another speaker. So in the cadastral survey, basically it was done with the use of this chain table measurement and plane table. So these are the fundamental things during British period or before that it was been it has been done. And but still then they have done a very havoc and good work. And we are managing and we are maintaining the same thing. Of course, that uh, procedure still government in maximum state they are following rather than nowadays very high sensitive uh, technologies they are using this high resolution satellite data these cadastral maps are georeferencing and they are making digital but still then government is hesitating to accept that the old maps old system that is gentle measurement and that is in hard copy they are believing and they are taking that those are the bible so what are the significance why you will go for this uh, digital digital in the cadastral map for having the better maintenance and availability of data very easily. And we can update the cadastral as and when required because most of the times these parcels are splitting or it is merging. Very rare cases it is merging, but most of the cases it is splitting because uh, lands are selling by the owners in time to time. And third thing is that land use changes using aerial or satellite remote sensing data that is another important things that is very significant also that's why I need the digital copy and second thing and most important thing is records of rights that is the Khatoni information those are required to be transmitted in the map now this is the age of uh, GIS Ge uh, geographic information system it is the boon for the society in the modern age the records of rights it means that data those are in tabular form you can integrate in the spatial map so that is the another advantage and we can do the social engineering a lot of things we can do on that now what is the prevailing system as i told you the cadastral maps are prepared in different states different scale somewhere it you what, uh, what is four thousand and five thousand like that and the uh, map that is in one place and khatoni record khatoni that is in other places. This is the prevailing system. But we need in a single click the map as well as the Khatoni information should be there. So that's why this it is required. Now you see this Khatoni, uh, this uh, cadastral maps, how it is being kept. Still, most of the states they are keeping like this. But of course, now it is the age of land record modernization. Government of India has taken the project NLRMP, National Land Record Modernization Program. And there are two components. First is the soft copy preparation, and second copy is the survey survey. Survey survey, it means that each splitted person to be updated. There is a huge work, but most of the state, the first component, uh, component is over, second component is going on. So, what is the advantage of the proposed system? You know, the digital version of cadastral map can easily be as well as seamlessly. I mean to say that the cadastral map. You see the hard copy and there are four side four village will be there in the boundary if you place one by one nowhere it will be matching very nicely either gap or overlap is there but on ground i don't think so nowhere is will believe that any gap is there but if you make the soft copy then nicely you can do the edge matching so this is the first and foremost i mean merits for the digitization or the seamless cadastral map preparation uh, keeping in view the security uh, aspect also that you see the hard copy where it is kept it may be burned it may be the weeding may destroy because germs are there and mutilated also and also that due to the water it can damage if damage if the water is uh, thrown on that then it is very difficult to get it uh, dry fasting if at all it is dried then it will be crinkled and where the probability or it is there that elongation of that and if elongation then the scale will be changed because you know that one millimeter on paper in hard copy that is four meter on ground at least so that to maintain that 
uh, accuracy it is very difficult. Now there are certain things are there. Initially, you have to scan the maps. The objectives are the scanning the, of the maps. Thereafter, it will, it will, you will do the digitization on the same scale. Then, if you are preparing through the software, then you have to get a hard copy and you have to validate it. After validation, vital work is a georeferencing of cadastral maps. Somewhere it is saying Sajra map, somewhere it is saying Bhuchatra. The georeferencing or geofencing is very, very important things and very fascinating thing at the present day. Now, thereafter, if you georeference made the cadastral map, then the seamless map will be prepared each and every village and very precisely it will be done with the use of this remote sensing and high resolution satellite data. So, now where are those cadastral maps or Sajra maps are available? In each state, there are three sources are there. First is Board of Revenue under the chairmanship of uh, 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 Board of Revenue. It is one state is there. Next is in uh, district collector or Mohapis Khana, it is there. Third, it is with the Lekpal or Kanungo in the Tasi. But most accurate copy will be on the Avilekhaga, that is controls on the DM in certain causes, but I'm not going to elaborate. So the, there are, you see, the cadastral maps are in very large, that is maybe say zero size or even more than age zero size also. In because earlier stage, the land holdings were very, very bigger. And at the time, even double bed seat sizes, which is there. So you need, I mean to say, keeping in view the uh, special uh, this boundary of this or this uh, aerial of the cadastral map, you need the large scanner that is A0 size or is bigger. And the ideal scanner, there are two types of scanner you know, that is the uh, flatbed, another is the wide comb. But ideal scanner is a flatbed because their stretching will be there. So no loss or no crinkles or no this uh, shrinkage will be there and no extension there. So that's why ideal scanner is uh, this thing that is the flat bed. You see, this is a cadastral maps. What I was telling, there are two things. You see the boundary, there is a plot boundary, and second is cadastral and this uh, parcel number. Both are visible nicely. So these are the certain characteristic characteristics while preparing, while doing the scanning, you have to maintain these are the things that is the intent uh, that scanning should be done in the firewall that very uh, nice visible in the within the 100 DPI scanning. And if it is faint or hedgy, then you have to go for the DPI increase, maybe 200 or 300 DPI like this. A wrinkle free, it has to be made because most of the places the media is in cloth or this oxy cloth they will get, get to, I mean, that distorted. So before using the scanning, you should make a little stretching or little, uh, little worm of iron, it should be used to stretch that so that area losses or area extension could be avoided. You see, if a more than age of size scanner is there, you can take the photograph with the high resolution camera, more than 10 megapixel, you can take it and you can make the uh, JPG and thereafter you can go for digitization and somewhere the core parts, five parts are there. In some cases it has been torn or you required to be splitted. You have to take separately. After that some software are there, you can stitch it. Nowadays very good software are there for stitching provisions are there and you can comfortably do the work. So thereafter you have to go for the digitization. For the land record, this uh, AutoCAD map is a very genuine and cheap software is there. Of course, RGIS is there, but comparison uh, to the cost, RGIS is most costlier. And also, but AutoCAD is very simple and easy. In AutoCAD, uh, you can prepare and you can put in that file. And after that, you have to, for the geoferencing and for the arc editing, you require to be taught SHD file. You see different layers while digitization in uh, AutoCAD, you have to put different layers, say for parcel one layer, say for road one layer, say for this uh, plantation, there is a point point and, and dot, dot is there, that is another layer. So number of layers will be made uh, while using the uh, uh, CAD uh, mapping or using through the uh, CAD digitization. After that, in, you have to 
uh, <clears throat> integrate in the GIS file. You know, all the layers will be coming into the safe file in single layer, and you can move, you can prepare that transform that file in safe file and where the all those attributes will be there, which is parcel or the uh, attribute number, and wherever tree is there, wherever this uh, 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 somewhere that uh, dagoil is there, all the appropriate the attributes could be added. Now, as I told you, it is prepared by the software, so you need the quality checking. It means you have to get a hard copy print and you have to validate that. And also, this is a legal document. So you have to legally, you have to validate. Legally means that is from the uh, DM office, the Mohafis Kana, that is Tanungo, Lekpal, they'll validate starting from Gata Sankar to the area. They'll match it, they'll check it, and they'll uh, sign it. After that, after that, we have to edit it and have to go ahead. Now we'll come to the georeferencing. Now we've got ready the safe file of the cadastral map, and you have to procure the high resolution satellite data. High resolution means which re which the satellite is having resolution of 5.8 meter. That is this port data is a high resolution data, and of course, say quick bar wall view and this cutter set one, cutter set two, all are high resolution data. You need it, and you have to go for the georeferencing. But while georeferencing, you need at least four points, ground control points, because cadastral maps are basically related to the ground, and you need at least four points in a village minimum. But four point is very, very insufficient. It may be 14, it may be 20, or it may be uh, more than 50 also. As per the distance it is there, and you have to collect the ground control point that you know that uh, GPS, but where the GPS is having less ac uh, accuracy is very coarse, where you will get the accuracy 10 meter or more. But in ground, in this terrestrial map, which is a very high resolution, where you require the millimeter, uh, millimeter type accuracy, if not millimeter, in centimeter. So that's why that you need the ground control point using DGPS, that is differential global position system. The DGPS, it can give the millimeter level accuracy and it is having two source that is rover and uh, one is rover and another is base station and nowadays very sophisticated uh, this uh, dgps are there earlier days the base has to run more than three days but nowadays within few hours maybe five four five hours the base will be ready and you can collect the data through the rover also so you see in the figure right hand side the uh, dgps is picked up or placed and you see it is controlled by the constellation of satellites. So this is there. I'm not going to details of that. Now you see in one district, you see the one scenario for Sitapur, where you need, this is a high resolution satellite data or 2.5 meter, that is cutter set one. In that Sitapur district, in the cutter set one, at that time it was having 27, uh, 27 scene. Now you have to mosaic it. And after that, using the DGPS, you have mosaic it, and thereafter you place the uh, this uh, Tahsil boundary. So while taking the DGPS point, you have to know in the ground, say, say road and Pakka road and Kacha road junction is there, or some. If not, then somewhere field bonds has to pick up, and somewhere this road and this Nala cross section are there, which are visible in the high resolution satellite data as well as in ground, you have to collect the tick point and not less than eight to 10. And it should be placed using the uh, this geometrical software or this uh, uh, digital uh, software. Through that, you can insert, you can go for the digitization. Now it is the scenario for the georeferencing. You see, this is the safe, uh, safe file of the uh, this thing, uh, that is the uh, cadastral map. Now you see there are four or five points. It has been there, and those four points you have to put it in the uh, safe file, and as well as in the you see in the safe file it is there. Say here one point this road uh, road road junction one point we have taken here in the safe file. Another point is the road road junction there. So all around in four or five points you have taken. In that from here 
to the uh, that uh, this uh, satellite data which is georeferenced or which is the uh, using the dgps uh, that is the accuracy of say millimeter level and you transfer those points here so all those four points you see here one point here one point another one so almost it is distributed all over the village now we can transform for uh, the map on the satellite data then it will be the georeference you see it is placed on the satellite data now you see each persons are visible on the uh, satellite data now you can see the changes that cadastral map is prepared so more than 50 years back now a lot of changes you can see that you see this uh, uh, you see this is the this is the settlement and earlier it was very small now how much settlement is being enhanced in everywhere it is there in urban semi urban area it is there now once you geoference it then you you can go updation of the spatial and non spatial data non spatial data you can integrate using the, uh, the you can integrate that is the tabular form which data is there you can integrate with the use of the rgs software and once you click it then map will be showing area as well as the all those tabular data will be linked so you see this is the map where terrestrial maps parcels are updated you see big big parcel here it is one big parcel was there now it is been now it is been splitted more than 18 in numbers here earlier road was going inside now another road is there now if you update you can see precisely the a uh, lot of features are being changed in comparison to 50 years and that is visible in the uh, high resolution satellite data and in the if you place the map and the shape file on that so once you do it as i told you it is done by the software now you have to go for validation so that map is being validated in the area and we have find the percentage of accuracy so now you see a lot of villages are there which are being made seamless that is very very essential to make the seamless map village then uh, after uh, taking a few village it will be in the say uh, block a uh, few places uh, more than 15 uh, 17 then it will be block block to tahasil tahasil to district now entirely you can do the mosaicing in the district now one district another say like the state you can go for mosaicing this is the uh, seamless map of one block in the district now one important thing i should also tell here mention here the maps which are using that census department is preparing earlier and nowadays also a lot of maps are there you see the boundary of the map in the black color there is one Muldera village is there how what is the shape now in the cadastral map this is the another shape the real shape is in the cadastral map so this is the not appropriate the prepared by the census department but using the cadastral map this is very very accurate map so each and every parcel will be liable and very very informative and very accurate because here cadastral map that uh, high resolution satellite data is involved and the cadastral is parcels are involved so it is very very accurate so that's why it needs india needs the cadastral maps to be uh, di make digital and it should be made seamless now once you prepare the all those cadastral maps now a lot of applications has to uh, you can do say chakbandiwar in most of the state the chakbandiwar that is the consolidation works are going on of course nowadays this uh, land recovery program is there it has been stopped almost and the chakbandiwar could be done using the uh, cadastral maps and satellite data similarly for micro water shed mapping utility services mapping parcel wise flood assessment that is our main objective for this training and similarly for the sodic land reclamation now i highlight for the only the flood assessment in, now you see in different state later different schemes are there somewhere somewhere ambedkar gram somewhere uh, lohit uh, uh, Lohi, uh, lohia gram all those schemes in those villages the utilities are there that has to map and government will plan that if the scs denominated villages there ambedkar or lohia then they are has to be saturated as per the norm so those villages the terrestrial map will be used very very purposefully and solve the problem as well you can monitor the work also in for the abbas because also it is there that you might be knowing the uh, others gram concept is there after introducing this modi government the others gram concept is there here the 
toilet are preparing and constructed mostly and you can geotag those uh, toilets in the different villages different uh, that others gram and you can monitor where it is there where it is not there and where it is repair also another important thing is that is there that micro water seed that is a iwmp integrated water seed management program this cadastral maps they are used for preparing a one um, water seed then that one water seed will comprise a lot of micro water seed now each micro water seed reflecting in different color and each micro water seed is having lot of uh, village map of course you know the water seeds they do not follow the uh, boundary administrative boundary it will follow the, rather than the hydrological boundary so keeping in view the micro water seed all those uh, cadastral maps are linked as well as uh, uh, as well as this made seamless and used for various purpose of uh, water seed development it is there now what are the types of structure to be given keeping on view of the uh, time shortage i am not going to details but however glimpse i'll tell that in the water seed somewhere you care the suggestion for soil and water resources action plan how those are to be improved so you need the structure like agro horticulture somewhere you have to prepare the check bund somewhere you have to prepare the contour bund to arrest the soil and increase the ground water and to uh, harvest the i mean surface water also so check dumps are there what are the conditions is there peripheral bunds that is there peripheral bunds these are the important that wherever road is there on the side of the road that uh, on the road that uh, that you have to give the agro horticulture type when some uh, trees could be there so that that bund could not be damaged or it could not be uh, uh, that uh, was out during the rainy season and another important is that desiltation you you know that most of the rivers and uh, talabs they are desilted so these are the things has to be removed now different action plans you can plan using this cadastral map you see in what are the parcels what are the parcels require what type of action where it is got agroforestry agro horticulture desiltation check road ban contour ban in parcel wise statistics are given for one that micro water seed now it is the important thing for the flower you see this is the one village of up obviously that is in mow district you see the uh, black color or the violet color is the flood parcels or the flood inundated area now you see in the village say at least 30% area is flood uh, inundated now you can see in one parcel how much it is affected from there you can calculate the flood affected area if the flood water is there more than 5 days then crop will be totally damaged you can calculate the crop damage also but this work could be done so after receiving the uh, inundated map from the nrsc space data what uh, dr bhanumurthy was telling after so when flood is there within nowadays within 10 hours that uh, flood inundated maps are getting from the nrsc and you can you are having ready already the, the this cadastral map now you can superimpose and you can calculate what are the parcels are inundated and you can you can put the relief measure because this work earlier used to do the kanungo the dm office and they used to take they cannot go during the flood time in those villages so after the receding of the flood they'll go and they'll take lot of times after receding of flood they take a few months but where is this uh, this remote sensing and gis technology it will do after receiving the so within half hour after receiving the cadastral map so you can calculate the parcel wise inundation how much relief how much muabja to be given farmer and what are the parcels are affected all those things you can plan now this is the one village you see earlier this is the bottom side one river is there so due to the that due to the cutan and the shifting though it is the area is changing you see the cadastral map this is the village from this side and where is district is changing the, here in this confluence due to the cutan it is shifting the rivers and you see what is affect now you can see in the entire village that where are shifting and where are margins are there so similarly for this is zodiac land reclamation so now i can conclude i am not going uh, further because keeping already i have crossed the time uh, more than 10 minutes 
the parcel level information on floods is very very useful on the compensation of farmers and modernization of cadastral maps are the need of the hour so this is from my side thank you very much for hearing this topic okay you take the stage now thank you so much sir just a minute let me check thank you so much sir for giving such a wonderful session uh, we all know that flooding is the most common natural hazard and it causes widespread loss of life property and livelihoods worldwide as we can we have already seen in our both the lectures water related as our water related disasters and the cadastral mapping which is being used for the flood mapping flood mapping is very crucial to understand the flood risk management and risk reduction and it is very it is one of the best known forms of the mapping as sir told because it is the mapping that shows all the land parcels in relation to one another and to the adjoining areas so it's very important to understand how we can effectively and efficiently make use of such type of the mapping for the flood risk reduction measures <clears throat> so thank you so much sir for the session uh, sir so far no question is there in the chat box or qa box if it is there we will take the questions for the Thank you, sir. So moving ahead towards our the third technical session, I would like to call upon Mr. Ajit Batham. Mr. Ajit Batham is currently engaged as a young professional in Center for Early Warning and Communication and Geometric Meteorological Risk Management Division at NIDM. He uh, previously he was uh, posted at Delhi Disaster Management Authority in Department of Revenue. And he has worked with government of Delhi there in the capacity of project officer in two district disaster management authorities. He did his uh, PG, uh, that is MBA in disaster management and has several experiences in the field of disaster management. And he has completed his bachelor's in electronics and communication. So with these words, now I request now Batam to take over the stage and please address the audience. Over to you, Mr. Batam. Thank you, madam. Thank you for such a nice introduction. Can you please confirm my uh, PPT is uh, visible and on full mode? Yes, sir. your PPT is visible and your order belongs. Okay. okay. So, first of all, I thanks to the organizing team that is NITM and uh, Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, Meghalaya, to uh, give me this opportunity to deliver. Uh, lecture on disaster management and legal framework. So we have been talking about uh, since last two days, we have been talking about uh, disaster management. And uh, if we are talking about disaster management and risk reduction, then it, it is quite relevant to also talk about um, legal framework as well. So today I'm going to you know discuss about the disaster management and legal framework. I mean, basically, I will cover the uh, Disaster Management Act 2005, how it comes to the existence and what are the powers and functions like down in this particular Disaster Management Act 2005. So, yes, uh, first of all, we, we have to know the history behind this enactment of the Disaster Management Act 2005. So, as we all know that India happens to be one of the large, one of the hazard prone countries in South Asian region due to its unique geoclimatic conditions. Several disasters like floods, drought, cyclone, earthquake and landslide have been a recurrent phenomenon in our country. For uh, due to this, millions of peoples are affected uh, every year physically, I mean, through loss of their life, injury health and disability, as well as psychologically. So disaster results results in huge economic loss, scarcity of food and water, alteration of neutral natural environment, displacement of people, increased level of vulnerability. So over the couple of years, the government of India have brought about a paradigm shift in the approach to disaster management. You know? So disaster management occupies an important position in the country's policy framework as it is underprivileged and poor who are worst affected due to disaster. So here, uh, uh, if we talk about the disasters in India, so there were several worst disasters of, uh, of which uh, uh, 
uh, worst disasters of which I am sure you must be aware of, uh, uh, like Bengal famine, which happened in the year 1770 and 1943. And this was during the, you know, British rule, which resulted in death of about 10 million people in the area of Bengal, Bihar, and some parts of Odisha as well. So uh, next, uh, the, then you must also aware of uh, the, there was a Koryanga cyclone, which uh, came in 1839 and which hit the area of uh, Godavari district of uh, Andhra Pradesh. And it caused death around 20,000 people in the ancient city of Koryanga. Then uh, there was another one, uh, another one which had come in the year 1876 and it last lasted uh, till the 1878 and it was uh, you know all it, it is almost two years so which actually resulted in the loss of 9.6 million people so the, after then uh, came bhopal gas tragedy and i am sure you also must aware uh, of bhopal gas tragedy this came in the year 1984 and this tragedy also caused very massive human you know, loss. So then after that uh, cycle on uh, Odisha super cyclone 1999, this is also known as, uh, you know, paradigm uh, cyclone. And this is considered to be the most deadly devastating tropical cyclone in the Indian Ocean and, uh, and most destructive cyclone in India after 1971. And this also caused uh, death around 15 thousand so uh, why i am discussing the details of these disasters just because uh, uh, but because at that time in our country did not have any specific law to deal with such situation okay so history behind the enactment of the disaster management act 2005 actually goes to the uh, tsunami which hit india in the year 2004 Okay. So there are some other disasters, as I mentioned, the Indian tsunami 2004, Uttarakhand flash flood 2013, and Kashmir flood in 2014. And how we can forget about the recent COVID-19 pandemic, Nipah virus outbreak in Kerala, Cyclone Taute and Cyclone Yas and Uttarakhand flood and many more. So uh, I was uh, discussing about the Odisha uh, cyclone and uh, Gujarat earthquake. So the Odisha cyclone and Gujarat earthquake caused massive destruction and from the year 1999 to 2000, an average of 4,344 people lost their lives and about 30 million people were affected by the disasters every year. So in recognition of the importance of disaster management as a national priority, the government set up the high power committee in the in the year uh, in the year 1999 under the uh, you know chairmanship of uh, uh, jc panpuji and a national subsequently a national committee after the gujarat earthquake uh, for making a recommendation on preparation of disaster management plans and suggesting mitigation mechanism was also formed so for the first time the high power committee identified 35 uh, 31 disaster categories organized into the five major groups such as water and climate related disasters geological related disasters chemical industrial and nuclear related disasters and biological related disasters which includes biological disasters and ep epidemics uh, so, and also the 10th five year plan had also a detailed chapter on uh, you know, disaster management and the 12th finance uh, finance commission was also mandated to review the financial arrangements of disaster management. So, as I was, uh, as I was uh, uh, talking about the, you know, 2004 uh, worst tsunami that hit in India. So, from here, that is, uh, it actually paved the way of, for establishment of Disaster Management Act 2005. Before that, there was no full-fledged act uh, to this country to deal with the such situations in disasters. Okay, so this disaster struck the country in more than like 
this tsunami struck uh, the country in more than seven states of India. It was the world's deadliest tsunami with over 230,000 people killed and half a million injured by the waves that battered the you know, low lying coast. So this is how then the, the Disaster Management Act come into the existence. And the Disaster Management Act 2005, uh, the, the objective of this act is to, this is an act to provide uh, the effective management of disasters and, and you know, uh, matters concerned here with or incidental there too, okay. So, this act is enacted by the parliament, Indian parliament, received assent of president of India on 23rd of December 2005. It goes to notified on 26th of December 2005, then came into effect from with effect from uh, you know 1st of August 2007, and it is also extended to whole of India. Okay. It envisaged the creation of uh, I mean this act has a provision of creation of the National Disaster Management Authority, which is uh, headed by the Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister of India. Then uh, it comes to the State Disaster Management Authority, which is headed by the Chief Minister of the Concerned State uh, to separate, uh, separate headed implement a holistic and integrated approach to disaster management in India. And there is uh, also a provision of uh, District Disaster Management Authority, which is headed by the District Minister of the Concerned District. Okay. So there are some uh, salient features of this uh, Disaster Management Act 2005. This act comprises 79 sections and 11 chapters. Okay. And uh, the Disaster Management Act 2005 defines the concept of disaster and disaster management in details. It also provides an institutional mechanism for monitoring and implementation of plans, the four levels of disaster management that is uh, national, state, district, and uh, you know, local authorities. This act also provides uh, for disaster response fund and disaster mitigation fund at national, state, and district level. So, uh, this is the definition of. Uh, I'm not going into the details of the, this definition. One may uh, read this definition. This is the definition uh, given in the Disaster Management Act of 2005. So. Again, the objective of the Disaster Management Act is the preparedness, prevention, mitigation, and response. Okay, so uh, let's go a little bit more into the Disaster Management Act. So the section 2E uh, of Disaster Management Act defines as a continuous and integrated process of planning, organizing, coordinating, and implementing measures which are necessary for you know prevention of danger and threat of any disaster it also should, it also have a responsibility to mitigation or reduction of risk of any disaster uh, or its severity consequences it's it is also responsible to have capacity building of the community along with the preparedness to deal with any disaster uh, it also it, it should also ensure to prompt response to any threatening disaster situation or disaster also assess the you know severity magnitude of effect of any disaster evacuation rescue and relief rehabilitation and reconstruction yes, this is the you know disaster management features so these are the four uh, things that comes under the uh, disaster management act uh, which is national disaster management authority state disaster management authority district disaster management authority and some local authorities that uh, uh, these local authority work on in the directions of you know district disaster management authority so here you can see the you know, legal institutional framework uh, of uh, disaster management act 2005 so the Ministry of Home Affairs is being the, is the nodal ministry for dealing with the disaster management in India. So uh, Ministry of Home Affairs has its own disaster management cell at the central level. Okay, it is directly governed by the central government of India. 
and uh, then at the, again at the central level it comes to national disaster management authority and uh, national institute of disaster management and national disaster response force also interconnected with the mha disaster management cell along with the ndma so uh, there is a national executive committee also uh, constituted uh, which which works uh, under the uh, supervision of ndma and so uh, similarly uh, there is a state government and uh, state government sorry subsequently there is a state disaster management authority which is headed by the state government of the concerned state and uh, similarly, uh, like the National Executive Committee, there is a State Executive Committee, which is, uh, you know, the provision is made under the uh, State Disaster Management Authority. And uh, when when we comes to the district administration, district level, so there is a uh, di district disaster management authority, okay, and uh, panchayat and municipalities. So. Panchayat and municipal parties and other other another local authorities uh, are are you know can be directed uh, to take precautionary measure or mitigative measures uh, in in the wake of any threatening situation by the uh, district disaster management authority. So here we comes uh, to the section three of uh, you know this disaster management act. So. The section three of this disaster management act actually gives the provision of, uh, you know, to establishment of the national disaster management authority uh, under the prime under the chairmanship of the honourable prime minister of India and other members not exceed. There should not be the other members uh, exceeding nine, and who are who shall be who shall be nominated by the honourable prime minister of India. And one of the member nominated as a vice chairman as well by the uh, chairman of the uh, NDMA. So here the powers and functions of uh, NDMA. I will quickly read it. These are the some uh, powers and functions of uh, National Disaster Management Authorities that are being laid down uh, in the this uh, particular act. So the NDMA is responsible for laying down the policies, plan and guidelines for disaster management. It has also a responsibility to approve the national plan. Further, approve the plans prepared by the ministries of or departments of the government of India in accordance with the national plans. It has also a responsibility to lay down guidelines to be followed by the state authority in drawing up the state plan. Further, a recommendations provision of funds and the purpose of uh, mitigation is also comes under the uh, NDMA. It also provides such support to other, country, uh, other countries affected by major disasters as may be determined by the central government. It takes uh, such uh, other measures for the prevention of uh, disasters or mitigation or uh, you know preparedness and capacity building for dealing with uh, threatening disaster situation it has also a, uh, you know responsibility to lay down broad policies and guidelines for the functioning of national institute of disaster management so uh, as i told that uh, uh, this is this comes under the you know uh, the National Executive Committee comes under the, it's, it is a part of uh, National Disaster Management Authority. So it has, it has also uh, several functions uh, in its own capacity. Okay, so National Executive Committee is for assisting the national authority in the discharge of its function. So NEC is uh, the responsible for implementing the policy and plan of national authority. It also ensure the compliance of direction issued by the central government for the purpose of disaster management in the country. So, and the secretary of ministry of home affairs is the ex officio chairperson and secretary of different ministries of uh, departments. So the chairman can, uh, the chairman of this uh, action, uh, national executive committee can invite any officer of government of India for taking part in any meeting of the National Executive Committee. 
and it can also constitute one or more more subcommittees and members of uh, NEC will be the chairman of subcommittees. I mean, when required, uh, uh, some other intellectual person who are dealing with the disaster management can also be added in the sub subcommittee committee under this. Uh, National Executive Committee, the provision of engaging expert to work with subcommittees. So, uh, again, uh, like uh, NEC comes under NDMA, then the, uh, another thing is the National Advisory Committee, which uh, which has been, uh, which is like, the provision has been laid down in the section seven of uh, this Disaster Management Act. And what this National Advisory Committee do is it is constituted an advisory committee comprising expert in the field of disaster management and having practical experience of disaster management at the national, state or district level to make recommendation on different aspects of disaster management. You know, as I told that uh, there are many, uh, it, it has a provision they can, you know, hire or uh, uh, many people who are who are very familiar with the you know, disaster management activities or with their relevant field. So they can be called upon, called on and can be, you know, uh, can a national advisory committee can be made. So again, advisory committee are paid allowances in cons uh, consultation with the national authority. Same like uh, uh, National Disaster Management Authority, the Section 14 of the Disaster Management Act uh, has a provision to constitute of a state disaster management authority. So the state government of uh, so state government uh, of uh, sorry the state government constitute this state disaster management authority and uh, just like NDMA uh, here the. The chief minister of respective state is the chairperson in NDMA. There was uh, uh, chair chairman uh, is the uh, prime minister, honorable prime minister of India, and in state level, it uh, goes to the chief minister of uh, uh, concerned state. Here, the eight other members should be nominated by the chairperson, chairman of the state executive committee is the ex officio member and the chief executive officer. The chairperson of the state authority may delegates one or more member to be the vice chairman of this authority. Similar to the functions of NDMA here also, the SDMA has some function powers and functions. Uh, so SDMA is the responsible for laying down the state disaster management policy. It also approved the state plan in accordance with the guidelines laid down by the national authority. It has a it has a responsibility to approve the disaster management plan prepared by the Department of Government of uh, Government of the state. It also coordinate with the implementation of state plan, recommended uh, provision of funds for mitigation and preparedness measures. You know, and it, it it review the measures taken being taken for mitigation, capacity building, and preparedness by the departments or government of his state. It also laid down detailed guidelines for providing standards of relief to the person affected by any disaster in the state. So here comes the state executive committee, just like the national executive committee that is provision under the NDMA. In the SDMA, we have a state executive committee. It is it has also it is it is formed under the section 20 of the Disaster Management Act 2005, and state executive committee for assist it is the it is for assisting state authority in the discharge of its function. The chief secretary of the state shall be the ex officio chairman of this committee. Uh, the four secretaries of the state government as uh, member of this, uh, you know, state executive committee. Chairperson of this authority shall exercise such powers and perform function as many prescribed by the state government and such other functions as may be delegated by him uh, to him by the state authority. It has uh, it, it is coordinate and monitor the implementation of national uh, national policy, national plan, and state plan. It also examine the vulnerability of different parts of states to disaster uh, to different form of disaster, and specifically, you know, measures for mitigation. 
uh, state executive committee also promote general education and awareness, give direction to the departments of government and advice, assist and coordinate activities to dep uh, departments of uh, you know, government. So it also provides the technical assistance to district authorities, advise state government on uh, financial matters. It also review response plan is at the state and district level. Examine the it also examine the construction in any local area. Ensure it SEC ensure the communication systems and disaster management drills are being properly uh, conducted or maintained at the districts or not. So a state uh, similar like uh, National Advisory Committee, here is the State Advisory Committee, comes under the section 17 of the DCDM Act, uh, and it has uh, it, it may be constituted advisory committee uh, comprising expert heading uh, field of the disaster. This is similar like the uh, NDMA, uh, sorry, similar like the National Advisory Committee, but this is this time at the state level. So here comes the third authority uh, that uh, that has a pro that is uh, being constituted under this act. Uh, so yes, uh, state go uh, district disaster management authority has been constituted under the section 25 of Disaster Management Act 2005. So state government constituted the district authority in the every district, uh, and the chairperson and the member not exceeded seven, and the collector. District collector or district magistrate or deputy commissioner of the district is the chairperson ex officio. One elected representative of local authority shall be the co chairperson ex officio, and the chief executive officer of district authority is the, you know, is also is a uh, member of this uh, district level committee. Superintendent of police, along with the chief medical officer, are also a member of uh, this uh, state. Uh, sorry, this uh, district level committee of disaster management, and the number not exceeded to other uh, district level officer to be appointed by the state can also. I mean, two other members can also be uh, nominated or appointed by the state in this district level authority. The state government shall appoint an officer not below the ADM ring, which is additional district magistrate ring, as the chief executive of authority. Uh, sorry, as a chief executive officer of the district disaster management authority. So these are some general powers and functions of. Uh, sorry, DEM. sorry for the interruption, Mr. Ajit. So there will be a very important session. So please, please try to conclude within a two minute. Okay, sir. So. Uh, some other important, uh, you know, institute uh, like uh, that has uh, provision in this uh, disaster management Act uh, five under section forty two NIDM uh, that is National Disaster Management Authority has been constituted and has a mandate of human resource development and capacity building for disaster management within the broad policy and guidelines laid down by the NDMA. And uh, also, there is a provision of National Disaster Response Force uh, under Section 44, which is the, comp uh, the NDRF is a you know uh, mixture of uh, it. It comprises of the uh, various paramil paramilitary forces. So, as I have given some you know time consent, so I will directly jump onto the offenses and penalties. So, if I talk about the offenses and penalties, mm -hmm. so the section 51 to 60 talks about the offenses and penalties under the, this uh, Disaster Management Act. So, uh, what uh, section 51 says, says that uh, if uh, you know, obstruction, if any officer or employee of the central government of the state or the state government or person authorized by national authority or the state, state authority. Or district authority, the discharge of his duty under this act. If the obstruction he feels, then the imprisonment for the term up to one year with the fine of both. Or if such obstruction refusal to comply with this direction result in loss of life of imminent danger, then implement. Im, uh, sorry, then implement imprisonment for a term up to. Two years. Similarly, if somebody uh, you know claim a false uh, news, 
and it is a punishable with the imprisonment uh, up to two year and also with fine. If somebody misappropriate uh, misappropriate of money or material during any disaster, then it it is punishable with imprisonment up to two year and also with fine. Again, if somebody gives a false warning under uh, then the implement then there is a provision under this act. Uh, a imprisonment for the for a term of one year and uh, with five uh, with fine or both. Similarly, there are uh, many you know uh, uh, imprisonment or fine criteria for offenses by department of the government, failure of officers in duty or his convenience uh, you know of the provision of this act. So yes, uh, there are some other miscellaneous powers. Uh, so I'm quickly uh, you know, concluding this. Uh, so if we you know further, there is uh, important clause and important power in this section. So if we talk about immunity from the legal process, uh, so the officers, and then this is very important, that's why I'm covering this. So I mean, uh, the officer and employee of the you know, government as well as the authority shall be immune from the legal process in regard to any warning in respect of any impending danger committed or disseminated in their official capacity or any action which has been taken or any direction which has been you know issued by them is uh, in pursuance of such communication or dissemination so uh, here i would like to you know uh, just uh, uh, talk about the recent uh, COVID-19 situation that uh, we know that uh, how many have uh, us have heard about the, you know, the disaster management act during COVID-19 pandemic. So COVID-19 uh, has uh, declared the national disaster by the Honorable Prime Minister under Section 6 and Section 10 of this disaster management act. But so, so that uh, the entire country has a uniform lockdown regulation, you know, which uh, which one actually easier to implement or specifically with regard or specifically on which services and functions have to be allowed and what not to be allowed because before the national lockdown announced there was a state specific lockdown in this country and the lockdown was in 82 districts of the india and both under the epidemic act uh, were in the consistent of, uh, you know, sorry, uh, this lockdown was under the ep epidemic act earlier. So, because if you remember, there were, uh, you know, certain conflicts between uh, districts and state and central government. So, uh, for the very first time, disaster management act was invoked during the COVID-19, and uh, there was an, uh, you know, uh, pandemic act, which is 125 year old act. It was also invoked with the certain amendments uh, that made in the order to uh, deal with such disastrous situation. So here I uh, uh, conclude my session. I hope uh, I'm <laughs> I'm not an advocate, but I hope I did a little bit justice to justice to this uh, topic. Thank you so much for giving me opportunity to share on this uh, topic. Thank you. Over to you, madam. Thank you so much, Mr. Vatam, for nicely highlighting the legal framework of disaster management in India. Rightly said, uh, India is a multi hazard prone country with the diversity of the eco, geological, and socioeconomic settings. And the code practices and the guidelines for preparedness, and particularly on the relief, existed even before the independence. But with the growing understanding on the risk, as you mentioned, the paradigm shift to the prevention mitigation, and now on mainstreaming disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. And various frameworks helps in highlighting and the key institutions for the um, making the policy guidelines, capacity development, and the emergency response at the national, subnational, and local levels. You have very nicely explained all the legal frameworks which are existing in India right now. Thank you so much once again, Mr. Vatim, for joining and sharing your thoughts. Um, there are no questions right now from the audience. We will see if anyone posts the question. So we will forward to you, sir.
Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you. So now we are uh, approaching towards the end of our three days online training program. So over this, uh, I would we are fortunate to have with us the vice chancellor of Northeastern University and uh, the head of our department, uh, Professor Surya Prakash. So one by one, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Pra Prabhas and Shankar Shukla for the special interest. Before I call upon Ms. Shukla. Sir, I would like to give a brief introduction of Professor Shukla. He has a variety of positions in the various departments. And he is the AC member of GCU Uttarakhand and we are a member and the OC at the He is also a nodal officer in this wing from the Seed Hub and is a joint director at Breeder Seed Production Center. He is also the editor of Kisan Bharti from Hari Khet. And see, and he has the area of specialization like the seed science and the soybean breeder. He has also a number of contributions like uh, in variety six, uh, germ plasma register two technologies developed eight, and total citations he has fifty three, and he has written overall forty four research papers and four books and four bulletins. He has received many international and national awards. So the best paper presentation in the, uh, two times he has received the award of best paper presentation in the year 2007 and 2010. He has also received the award of the scientist of the year twice uh, in 2011 and 2015 and the Shatabdi Samman in 2013. So with these words, now I call upon Professor Prabha Shanga Shukla to kindly take over the stage and please address our audience. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Program uh, Chair Professor Surya Prakash, Pattern of the Training, Major General M.K. Bindal, Distinguished Speaker Dr. G. Rajasekhar, Professor Devesh Walia, Dr. Bhanu Murthy, Dr. K. Vanarji, Dr. S. Kumar, Dr. A. Haldar. Ms. Deepali Jindal, along with Mr. Ajit Batham and Arun Rai, other members online join this program. I hope much about uh, discussed with this training program. And this training program, we know, conducted. Uh, under the Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsava program in the country already going on. In this context, uh, National Institute of Disaster Management also organizing this uh, three-day online uh, training program. And this is a, a really very relevant uh, topic, especially for capacity enhancement on disaster risk reduction in education sector. We know the disaster either in the education sector or any other sectors. The disaster risk is the potential loss expressed in lives, health, status, livelihoods, assets, and services, which could occur to a particular community or society due to the impact of natural hazards. Disaster risk reduction is a systematic approach to identify, assessing the reducing that risk, especially the purpose of disaster risk uh, management is to minimize vulnerability and disaster risk throughout a society to avoid or limit the adverse impact of natural hazards as well as the facilitate sustainable development. The two institutions, one is National Disaster Management and uh, other is State Disaster Management, especially for the Meghalaya, not only state level, also from district level, District Disaster Management Department are running in the country. But to think 
with the work of the uh, with the work of disaster management how to minimize the disaster risk we cannot check the disasters naturally comes time to time in the country but we can manage we can reduce the disasters which ever happened in the country disaster risk reduction in education in uh, in the period of the emergencies or in any period of the disaster it is a kind of systematic attempt to analyze and reduce the disaster risk in order to enable the education system to provide learners to continue and out of the school children to assess the quality of education both during uh, the disaster and after the disaster or after the emergencies disaster risk reduction protect the lives and livelihoods of the community and individuals who are most vulnerable to disaster or emergencies in different period from the before the independence or after the independence whether the crisis is caused by nature or human disaster management limits its negative impacts on those who is tend to lose the most and especially if we think already uh, some uh, speakers also mentioned the disaster management or you can say the global disaster management during the covid pandemic has a challenge different developmental sectors including education education in one of them some studies are provided one on the biological and hazards some biological impact disaster in and other the pandemic in the context of the country for disasters risk reduction the work is continuous going on a kind of different kind of disasters time to time may occur naturally biologically and some the jaha physically which generally the after the analyzation have the over impacts on the education sector education sectors most affected areas to be discussing here today the overall impact of the disasters especially the covid 19 on education sector with the specific focus on the disaster risk reduction how to reduce the risk education and education for the sustainable development disaster risk reduction and education are going if you are going to analyze from the perspective of the school community family linkage specific cases analyze of the covid 19 response in the education sector so there are the different phases you can also divide in the four phases of the response are characterized with three specific uh, three to four specific areas mitigation of the covid impact on educational programs and the participation preventive exacerbation of covid transmission within the outside school maintaining education program integrity despite and this small gadgets you can say the mobile telephone or media played an important role to minimize the risk of the education even after announcement of the lockdown no one in position to say that how we can manage this pandemic even though with the application of modern tools and technologies mobile is one of them 
different platforms were developed to educate not 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 only to educate not only to educate also to provide a kind of facility to educate our children transfer the knowledge from uh, one areas to other areas or you can say that from the government sector to the uh, state from government uh, central government to state government from state government to district government from district government to uh, up to the village or panchayat level and also from the uh, government to the uh, private sector and from private sector to end users of this country with this we are in position to manage the covid 19 pandemic even in the period of the sumanis different sumanis in the, those uh, majorly affected in the area of the jo hai coastal regions immediately due to jo hai application of the technologies interpretation of the data country in position to announce the something ki before two year before 24 hour or uh, 40 hour a sumani may come in this area to so be aware to so with this i can say in this uh, the pandemic uh, positions pandemic situations which is already is still going on in the country with the help of the gadgets mobiles not only the mobiles also i learn from some villagers for the education management point of view i just listen from the villagers where the net and other facilities are not available even though villagers manage the education system with the jo hai mic and appear their children a person will announce with the mic at this time and uh, 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 in their jo hai houses in the in the houses children sit together children one or two uh, children jo hai of the jo hai village may sit together and uh, learn the jo hai education or also learn the some techniques i like that a different kind of technique and thinking also develop in this uh, area and uh, some like in, in india some leadership also plays not only in india one thing also would like to mention here some other countries also did the uh, very good work uh, uh, take the uh, good initiatives for the education in the emer emergencies or in the, uh, during the time of the disasters or post crisis transition programs just like the china engage in the building building the capacity of the education officials schools principals and technologies following the cyclone nargis in myanmar more than 60% of the affected schools were jo hai supported as part of the emergency response in bangladesh strength national emergency prepared preparedness and DP, uh, disaster risk management programs in the education system and contributed to education reconstruction rebuilding bolivia also did the work in this area uh, unicef even jo unicef supported education uh, provision in educator for the poor and jo hai indigenous population groups that are adversely affected by the natural disasters and climate changes as well as a comprehensive risk and knowledge management program that aims to prevent the 
prevent prepare for the respond to emergencies during the time of the disasters and minimize the impact of disaster on education sector peace building was also initiated in this period child also learn from the, the environmental education initiatives in Al albania zimbabwe also did a lot of work in the education sector so this is a very important especially for the children point of view so you know unicef advocated for the protection of the rights of the all the children particularly in the most deprived and the vulnerable countries vulnerable areas to help meet basic needs and co expand opportunity to reach the full potentials disasters including the situation chronic disasters caused by the environmental degradation or exacerbated and conditions of the most vulnerable negative impacting on children's right and aggravating the exclusion of the children's in different countries there is an increase in evidences that student of all ages can activate study and participate in the school safety measures and also work with the teachers and other adults in the community towards the minimizing risk before during and after disasters and uh, events so with this i hope this discussion and training really the participants will be benefited for the management of education during the disasters and a kind of already covid-19 type of disasters is already going on and we know viruses a link between the living and non living and i always mention this is just like the theory of the darwin survival of the fittest so we think in the form of the darwin of the survival of the fittest definitely our doctors researchers did a lot in this field that's why country or we are in position to minimize the risk of the covid 19 at this time i just gathered the information from the tv and others yesterday was the last was the day on that day the minimum number of covid affected uh patients are there are find out in the are uh, search in the country so with the knowledge with the technologies with the proper management with the timely dissemination of the information from one area to other area we are in position to manage the covid 19 in the meghalaya maybe natural calamities in the future so the education system or primary schools directly affected with this so i hope with the help of state disaster department and uh, district disaster uh, department sections after learning with this training we will in position to do something for our people 
our society with this i would like to congratulate the organizers who gave me time to speak in this training and uh, giving you the best wishes to the organizers organizers for the grand success of such kind of workshop and trainings thank you khublai and mitela thank you so much sir and we are very much fortunate to have you with us today and thanks for the inspiring talk and it was great to hear your thoughts on comprehensive disaster risk reduction and resilience and many thanks for the collab this collaboration also thank you so much sir thank you so proceeding further now i would like to call upon professor surya prakash for the directory address uh, professor surya please uh, take over the stage uh, thank you ms depali ji actually my network is poor so i will not be able to switch on my video but uh, before i start my valedictory address i would like to extend my heartfelt sincere thanks to professor shukla ji vice chancellor nehu who has spared his precious valuable time and uh, shared his ideas and views on the uh, field of uh, disaster risk reduction and resilience and also uh, actually joined us in congratulating uh, the organizing team for the successful conduct of this program we are very much thankful actually to our distinguished experts who have shared their rich knowledge experiences information ideas and innovations with our delegates and the participants as said by professor shukla ji now with the uh, no enactment of the disaster management act 53 of 2005 we have been able to establish disaster management authorities at the district state and the national levels who are trying to make endeavors to reduce the risks and enhance resilience in this sector and also our new education policy has also looked into the continuity and sustenance of education despite all odd situations so these efforts are being made not only by the national level organizations but also at the international level by the united nations who are looking into the perspectives for the children particularly i can say unesco and unicef they have worked a lot during these periods besides the who uh, during the covid situations and as well as the our united nations disaster risk reduction office although efforts have been made a lot still we have a long way to achieve our goals our goals of national policy on disaster management actually envisages is zero casualty and disaster free and resilient nation due to covid several casualties did happen despite our all best efforts and uh, this cannot be compromised and we have to actually strengthen further ourselves so that in future this does not repeat and we are able to avert any kind of you no know, unnatural casualties or uh, casualties due to disasters that actually get aggravated because of human interventions recently we have just concluded uh, uh, what uh, going with the, the cop 26 at glasgow where our honorable prime minister had also participated and he also talked about the disaster resilient infrastructure the coalition which has been established by the united nations and looking into the emerging threats from the changing climatic conditions fast rate of developments the uh, recent uh, threats from the biological disasters as well as uh, the other issues and challenges of human development that we are facing we have to work in an integrated and an holistic manner bringing all stakeholders together on one platform and also share 
and disseminate the relevant knowledge, information, innovations, ideas, and technologies with all concerned so that we can make the best benefit, as said by Professor Shukla. In case of cyclones, our India Meteorological Department did achieve a success uh, to predict the, them right from the day of their generation as a deep depressions to the day of their landfall and the time as well as the uh, pattern trends and the changes that are happening right from generation to its fall and impacts and subsequently post cyclonic events that are happening in those areas and the success has been uh, well applauded by even UNDRR in terms of reductions in casualties as well as economic and environmental losses. But we are not equally successful in all kinds of hazards. It includes the recent event which happened in the Uttarakhand state on 7th February, where uh, on 2021, 7th February, we had a major glacierate body and uh, rock mass fall which actually occurred in the higher reaches and the Joshimat block of the Chamoli district in Uttarakhand state and led to a loss of more than 200 lives almost 204 human lives were lost because of this disaster as well as huge economic and uh, uh, environmental damages happen because of such an event. Similarly, there are many other events like earthquakes where we are yet not well successful in terms of our predictions. Although very short period of warnings up to about a minute or two minutes uh, are uh, being tested, but that's useful only in automated systems, not in terms of human actions accurately. So we are working on different directions, realizing our weaknesses and strengths on disaster risk reduction, as well as the uh, existing challenges and the emerging threats. We are talking about uh, the education system, which has uh, changed its way recently, right from school to the higher education, where digital education, digital modes of education they have also received a priority. Now, this again has posed a new risk in terms of cyber risks and threats. So we have to work in different uh, ways according to our changing uh, you know, facilities, services, technologies, and the developments. So uh, and without ignoring the kind of events that are likely to happen and expectations, we have to continue these efforts and sustain and adapt ourselves and become resilient against the disaster and the crisis situations. There are a lot of things that we can talk about, but much has already been talked during the last days. So I'll not elaborate much on that. But I would urge that whatever lessons have been learned, from the last three days uh, deliberations, I would request participants to bring them into your practice to save your own lives and also protect others. Uh, not only the human lives, but our economy and environment as well. So in disaster management through the Sunday framework for disaster risk reduction, we have been talking about all inclusive and ecosystem based approach, which we need to follow. And I hope all will join hands with us and do the advocacy and dissemination of the knowledge acquired through such programs. Training of teachers and faculty development programs on disaster management are also one of the major uh, issues, uh, challenges that we are taking up uh, along with the UGC and AICT. We did develop some course curriculums and we are also working on development of course curriculums at the UG and PG level uh, for further education and development in the field of disaster risk reduction. We urge all universities to join hands with us through our India 
university institutional network on disaster risk reduction where more than 100 universities have already joined and we have also joined hands with all india association of universities as well as other partnering organizations so uh, we, let's uh, continue these efforts and i wish all the best to all for a safety health and quality of life on an equitable justifiable and right based manner and i wish a success to each and everyone in these endeavors with these words i would say ke manzilein unhi ko milti hain jo safar ikhtiyar karte hain aise musafir ko to yaar raste bhi intezar karte hain so we have started our journey towards disaster risk reduction collaboration is key as indicated during this year's uh, no mandate for international day for disaster risk reduction and we let's follow as vivekanand said stop not till the goal is achieved so woods are thick dark and deep and we have miles to go before we sleep before i sleep thank you very much and wish you all the best back to you dipali ji thank you thank you so much sir thank you for sharing and inspiring learning experience your insights input and support and we are really obliged to have you sir and in spite of busy schedule you have joined us and pledged our participants and your encouragement and support is always invaluable sir thank you so much for joining so proceeding further uh, i would like to call upon dr amrit lal hardar to kindly say a few words regarding the concluding uh, as a concluding remarks and also propose the vote of thanks for this 3 uh, days online training program over to you dr hardar thank you dipali now today we are having the privilege or uh, we are very much fortunate enough that professor prabhasankar sukla ji he has joined us in this last forum generally the vips will be very very busy but still then today he has given a time so we are very much thankful for that now with his with his uh, coordination and his team efforts from the institute uh, from the university that we are in position to make the success generally in this pandemic period all the students they are disturbed and of course they are busy as per their schedule but somehow they have given times to conduct the session of course rightly he said that professor uh, sukla vc of nehu that in this azadi ka amrit mahotsav mein hum log program kare but of course it is our normal duty but we have increased our number of uh, trainings in this period so sir we are putting uh, heartfelt thank to you for nicely uh, allow us in as per the appropriate time to host this training program of course it will be very very benefited for the students especially ug pg and research student so they should learn you know that uh, this uh, your area northeast north east india is very very vulnerable for at least two earth two uh, catastrophe that is earthquake as well as this flood so we have uh, sir for your knowledge i should say that in during this online training we have covered more than five natural calamities or disaster and also this today we have disaster man management legal plan for that so student will be i hope definitely all the student will be very much benefited as per our policy as per ni dm target the professor surya prakash he has given a brief idea sir now we are having also for the universities and uh, institution or network is there and already your university is uh, already a member of that that is i u i n d e r indian universities institution disaster risk reduction in that forum it is there you might be aware and our this institute is taking the regular activity on that so we are very much thankful sir for that also for the member of the iu i n d r now next i'll come up obviously that our executive director always he has supported that we should go ahead without any stop without any hurdles the to make and to propagate the the uh, i mean the messages or the education for the student and other uh, stakeholders so that this our india 
is very very prone to all kinds of disaster natural chemical biological a lot of other things so they should be aware and they should be at least if not they will be prepared and they will make other for the preparedness and develop and also we should try to make india as resilient professor suryaprakash rightly he said that it is a long time that we have to achieve the goal he has quoted the vivekananda's uh, uh, vision that we should go ahead without uh, without any stop with, uh, until the goal is achieved and so sir we are very much thankful to ed as well as professor surya prakash always he is the source of energy for all those our members in this uh, in this division so wherever he will be of course he is busy he is in personal leave but still he has joined and he has supported us to, uh, to make the success in this team so sir we are very much thankful to you and we expect time to time and all that not only time to all the time to support us so that we should be freely and properly you can conduct the training so sir we cannot so it is a heartfelt thank as a well gratitude to you sir now next is coming to the all the panel, uh, experts all over the eminent experts were joined to uh, to share the knowledge in different uh, different calamities natural calamities and man made calamities so it is very very thankful to you from the university of nehu uh, professor sikor kumar was there professor uh, dr bhanu murthy from nrsc hyderabad and also dr raj sikor from nrsc hyderabad and of course bhanu murthy is nowadays a retired person but still he is helpful and coordinator so and other say from gsi very good speaker was there he talked microgenesis and gravity magnetic for the fault how it is activating all certain things he told and it is very very uh, that uh, knowledgeable for the students to gain certain things regarding the uh, earthquake and other things so i am very much thankful to all the resource person from either from our nidm or from the national level institute next then the uh, panelist always here they are supporting so i am thankful to that and also this moderator he has done her proper uh, work of course one day uh, mr uh, dr lamfrang he has moderated the session nicely so it is very thankful to you and also professor uh, balia's team since beginning he is working and definitely we got lot of uh, success for that and also the attendees always the, they are there it is our charms and it is our energy to make success that training so i am very much thankful to all those attendees who are some of them are regularly attending and encouraging our charms and also the it team who are associated for this type of seminar webinar and training so it is we put the gratitude to them and now with this i expect that attendees and the students they will really enhance their capacity for the building of resilient india and and to be aware of the and also preparedness for the any, any kind of disaster thank you very much over to you dipak thank you so much sir thank you for uh, briefing up the whole 3 days online training program uh, with the audience and to our panelists and the distinguished speakers i thank each and every one for joining us and uh, listening to our eminent speakers and but i request the participants to try to make the session interactive please because until or unless you make the session interactive we won't found the kick to give a best presentation so we all these speakers try their best to give their best of the knowledge to all the participants audience researchers students so try to grab as much as you can possible from them so now we are drawing the curtain of the closing the curtain of this 3 uh, days online training program but before we close the curtain so i would like to highlight few things uh, regarding the certificate the participants who have maintained their attendance on all the three days they can check their certificates after 24 hours on in the training portal of nidm itself just you need to log in in the portal with your registered email id there you will find the enrolled events and from there you have to 
firstly go for the feedback, then you will able to download the e-certificate from the portal. Secondly, uh, I would like to mention one thing. On November 24th, we are having one of the webinar on uh, hazards in the Himalayan region due to climate change. So I request the participants, uh, if they are interested, to kindly register themselves on the training portal so that they can get the joining link for joining the session of the hazards in the Himalayan region due to climate change. Uh, we will be having the eminent speakers from uh, Geological Survey of India and the a distinguished scientist from the Divya Center for Climate Change, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. That's ISC Bangalore. Also, we are having the uh, speakers from there. Also, one of the speakers will be from NIDM itself. So, I request the participants kindly join us in that session also on 24th November, 11:30 a.m. onwards. So, with these words, I now sign off from this three days online training program. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Stay positive. Stay safe. Namaste.